Good to be here. I'm excited to give this presentation. I have some exciting information and good to see each one of you. And because this is going to be put up on YouTube, I'm going to introduce myself for everybody because some people may come to this on YouTube and not know who I am. My name's Fritz Springmeyer and I'm an author. I have been researching, investigating the Illuminati, the mother of all secret societies, for over 25 years. I wrote a series of books on the Illuminati, seven book series. And uh, I worked for a number of years trying to help insiders, people that uh, were members of the Illuminati, get out of that organization. And that was exciting, um, to say, say the least. Um, that was really an effort where I went where angels would fear to tread. And uh, um, anyway, I survived it all <laughs> to be here today. <laughs> and um, I'm always, I, I've told people before that whenever I give these talks, it's like uh, the strangest things happen. I, I came up uh, Highway 99 four lanes, right, and there's a barrier in between, and there was a guy going the wrong way. Now, how's that happen? <laughs> I had to go around him. <laughs> so anyway, there was a number of things like that happened today, and it was just like, wow, this is, a, <laughs> this is kind of a par for the course whenever I'm going to give a talk. <laughs> um, okay, this is the topic. The Role of the Illuminati, Occult Philosophy in 9-11. When I was asked to give this talk, I thought to myself, now what can I do that's fresh? This information is not necessarily new, but hopefully my approach to it will be um, fresh and give you uh, a fresh approach. Who are the Illuminati? I'm going to read from a book that I, uh, I haven't published yet. It's my, uh, my newest book. And um, I write, so what is the Illuminati? They are a worldwide secret society whose membership is almost exclusively drawn from elite powerful bloodlines, except for some special uh, non-bloodline occultists who are attached to the fringes. They were the governing body of the mystery religions in ancient times, and have since the days of the pharaohs considered themselves illuminated to divinity. Our present world system was created by them and is controlled behind the scenes by them. So, for those of you that aren't familiar, that is uh, a fairly accurate definition. Now, some of you have probably heard of the Bavarian Illuminati. The Illuminati itself, these bloodlines, created a branch of themselves, just like this library is a branch of Multnomah County Library System. They created a branch, the Bavarian Illuminati. And we learned about the Bavarian Illuminati from one of the most intelligent men, most respected men in Europe of the time. Um, they were created, uh, the Bavarian Illuminati was created in 1776. And there was a high-ranking Freemason who was one of the top scientists in the world at the time, James Robeson. And he, he watched the Illuminati come into the Masonic lodges and illuminize them. So he wrote an expose of it because he didn't want to be illuminized to divinity. He wrote an expo expose, Proofs of a Conspiracy. And one of the little tidbits that he gives in this book was he tells us, because he was well informed and well connected, he informs us of what the ritual was for the level of regent in the Bavarian Illuminati. It's just a little tidbit that he throws out there that is kind of meaningless until you fast forward and there were a group of, of college students and you can just picture them thinking to themselves, you know, how college students try to, how boys are always saying, well, let's go do this, let's go do this. So they decided to sneak into the tomb, which is the building 
uh, the headquarters uh, uh, at Yale University for the Order of the Skull and Bones. And when they snuck in to the tomb, they went into one of the rooms, and up on the wall were some words written in German, and they managed to copy that down and, and, and tell people what they had seen. It didn't mean anything to them. Those words were the ritual words for the regent level of the Illuminati, of the Bavarian Illuminati. Therefore, we have confirmed uh, proof that indeed the rumors that people have been saying for a long time that, that the Order of the Skull and Bones is a branch of the Bavarian Illuminati, we know that as a fact. And, um, and then we also have some pretty good historical facts about who was behind Adam Weishaupt, which was a pseudonym, uh, when he created the Bavarian Illuminati. So if you trace the people behind him that financed and mentored him, those go back to the original Illuminati. So it all connects. So Yale uh, has five, uh, five senior fraternities. The Order of the Skull and Bones is just one of them. Now, the Order of the Skull and Bones has gotten all of the uh, focus, and people have pretty well ignored the fact that there's four others. There's the Order of Scroll and Key, there's the Order of Book and Snake, Wolf's Head, which has a military focus, and Brazilis. So those senior uh, societies are different than what other colleges have, because generally, you know, when you're going to college, you join a fraternity like, let's say, when you're a sophomore or a junior. But these are senior societies that are preparing people for when they uh, launch into the world. And they have occult rituals, and um, they're very secret. But they're not the only... Um, uh, fraternities that the uh, Illuminati has as chapters. Actually, what's also gone unnoticed under the radar is that a lot of uh, colleges have uh, created branches. Wesleyan has the, the Skull and Serpent and the Mystical Seven. Princeton has the Ivy Club and the Cottage Club. Penn State has the Skull and Bones. Um, Columbia has Axe and Coffin, ordered the Axe and Coffin. Dartmouth has the Dragon Society, the Cobra Society, Phoenix Society, Fire and Skull Society. Harvard has the Pig Club and the Fly Club. Oxford has the group. So there's more fraternities. There's more branches of the Illuminati than just the Order of the Skull and Bones. But the Order of Skull and Bones is very interesting because, like I say, we can track, we have been tracking them, looking at where, who their membership are, what positions of power their membership have. Um, and it's very in, in, uh, interesting to see that, that these members of the Order of Skull and Bones have incredible power. And um, when they start their careers, they will be like a nobody. And you're looking at them and you're like, this person doesn't have any experience. And they're given this position of power. And then the next thing you know, they bounce from this field over to this field where you would think the person that's giving that position of power should have uh, all kinds of experience. You know, I mean, they may be put into Department of, of Defense. Well, who should run the Department of Defense? Somebody who has all kinds of military experience, right? But they'll just throw somebody in there that's order of skull and bones that, you know, doesn't have any, uh, doesn't, doesn't seem to have the qualifications at all. I'm sure they're giving them help, though, behind the scenes. Um, so step by step, over many years, I have put the pieces together um, on these things, investigated different societies like one insider who ended up losing his life after he gave me information. He told me about the Pilgrim Society. That's another Illuminati organization. And so... Uh, Eventually, I was able to construct a nice little pyramid diagram of it all. 
And this diagram <laughs> got, got uh, became rather famous. It's like in a thousand places on the internet. Except the only thing about it is, is everybody dropped Fritz Bringmeier copyright 1995. <laughs> so you don't know where it came from, but it, it's gotten out there. So that's great. Um, so I know how the, these things connect. I know the, the memberships uh, uh, to some degree. I know the bloodlines. I know these families. And so we're going to look into this. Now, uh, the, the thing of it is, is we've had a lot of people uh, investigate how did this happen? How did 9-11 happen, right? Um, but today we, we're going to focus on the beliefs of the perpetrators, you know? And um, for those of you that believe that the government is God and whatever they say is the gospel truth, you know, what I'm going to say right now to you is, is that even if the government is God and what they say is gospel truth, Think this thing through here that I'm going to present to you. Science, scientists, scientific method depends on what? A theory, right? So don't denigrate a theory. If you, want to, if you want to lump everything I'm saying into the category of theory, don't trash that because that's how science works. It comes up with a theory, right? But I'm going to talk to you about these people's beliefs the Illuminati are Satanists, Luciferians and Satanists, and, and what they believe is not theory. It's there if you want to go out and look. You don't have to scratch that hard. If you want to take a fast track, read my books. But uh, if you start investigating the occult, you'll find out that there's, there's plenty out there that will tell you. So we don't, we're not dealing, when I tell you about their beliefs, we're not dealing with theories. We're dealing with actual facts. How those, those facts are applied to the 9-11 situation, uh, I suppose some people may uh, call that a theory. But I think by the end of this presentation, you'll have a different view on things if, if, if you're already not in line with where I'm going. By the way, how much time do I have? As much as you want. Oh, wow. <laughs> OK. <laughs> The library closes at five. It's not going to take that long. Now, I'm excited to hear this, too, because I haven't heard this talk either. Uh, this is all, all <laughs> I don't know exactly what I'm going to say either. Um, but if we read satanic books like Aleister Crowley's books, they give us a very in-depth idea on what they believe. You know, uh, and so we're going to look at some of that. And we, we, you don't have to take my opinion. I could care less about what my opinion is. It's what these people believe. That's what we're looking at today, is what do these people that are Illuminati believe? And how would that maybe relate to this whole crime of 9-11, right? I mean, when we're talking about a crime, what's one of the interesting things about it? What's the motive, right? Now, of course, we know that part of the motive is just simply greed. Right? I mean, some of these people that I'm talking about here, uh, uh, Rice, she, uh, she, uh, she happened to um, been one of the directors of Chevron. Chevron was very interested in Iraq's oil. And then, uh, you know, um, uh, the others that were connected to Halliburton and everything, we'll get into that. So definitely, a, uh, a motive of greed, but why did it happen the way it happened? Exactly the way it happened. I think when you see what I'm going to present, you're going to go, oh, this is giving uh, more of the motive behind the way it laid out, the way it played out. Okay? So there was a grandmaster. Uh, he died before I started. Uh, formally investigating the Illuminati, but his daughter, who was one of the people I was helping out of the Illuminati, uh, he told her that the whole world's a stage for the Illuminati, right? So, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. This should all have been put on a PowerPoint presentation. 
So you're getting it on sheets of paper instead of PowerPoint. But uh, what is ritual magic? I'm, I'm taking this definition straight from them themselves. I, I, like I say, I mean, this isn't my opinion. This is how these people think. So ritual magic, the definition, the art of changing consciousness at will. Okay, a change of consciousness. Interesting. That's what magic is. What's the purpose of a ritual? It's a vital part of the Illuminati life. It's used to control the participant's thinking and alter life. Hmm. Okay. What's the elements of a ritual? Well, you use symbols, numbers, geometric patterns, and words. You employ, it would employ some form of worship, to, depending on which god you're worshiping that day, whether it's Lucifer or Satan or some god or goddess, it's going to employ some owed some worship there. And then there's going to be a sacrifice, like a burnt offering or sacrifice lives. And they often use hypnotic trances, and it's done at a sacred site on special days. Okay? Ceremonies are carefully orchestrated with precision. Um, <clears throat> so, I wrote an entire book on ritual sites, Illuminati ritual sites, so I have uh, an idea of what kind of ritual sites they like. So what kind of ritual site, or what kind of places are picked as ritual sites? Well, in general, they pick a sacred spot. This picture here is in, um, is in New Hampshire, and um, it's an ancient Druidic site that, um, <clears throat> that is used for, by the occult, used by these people. So, so uh, this, the, uh, this is Mystery Hill here in New Hampshire. Um, but if we go outdoors, we can put a pentagram on the ground like this, and associated with the pentagram is a goat. Okay, that's very important in this whole thing, that you see that the goat and the pentagram go together. Um, and then, if we would go indoors, and this is a picture, I know you can't see it very well, but we'll get to other pictures, so you'll get the idea. Um, this is a Masonic Lodge, and in front of the Masonic Lodge are twin towers, right? What are those twin towers? They have the name Joachim and Boaz. Um, so, this, <laughs> When you look at this Masonic Lodge here, this floor here that has the pseudo windows, the windows actually aren't windows, they're just, they just put them there to make it look like a window. Um, although I actually have seen like one out of a hundred Masonic Lodges actually has real windows, but generally they're just fake windows. And um, this looks like it's the first floor, but, there, but it isn't. There's actually a basement. Because properly speaking, this, this lodge or this temple here has three floors. The second floor is called the uh, Temple of Solomon. And that's this right here. This is the Temple of Solomon, and in front of the Temple of Solomon are twin towers. Okay? That's a standard. That's, that's replicated zillions of times in, in this world. Okay, so Christopher Friedrich Nikolai, and I give his, when he lived, 1733 to 1811, he was a member of the Bavarian Illuminati, what we've been talking about. He was a Freemason, Freemason and an intellectual. He was the handler slash mentor of Adam Weishaupt. And what did he say? He described the sign of Baphomet, which is the goat and the holy pentagon, pentagon, as the most powerful symbol of all ceremonial rites. Well, is that the case for Satanism? Do they really consider it that important? Well, here, the Satanic Rituals by Anton LaVey. What does he use in his book on Satanic Rituals? He uses the pentagram, which if you understand the pentagon 
encompasses a pentagram, um, and inside that is the goat. Okay, and again, here we see it being done in real life. We have the priest, the satanic priest, dressed as a goat, the goat of Mendes, in the uh, pentagram, uh, pentagon, pentagram there. Okay, now I'm probably uh, insulting your intelligence telling you all this because really this is probably common knowledge everywhere because here on the Simpsons we have them hail Satan inside a, a pentagram doing hail Satan in the Simpson cartoon so it's it's not like it's a secret and uh, then here we have the pentagram and this is some satanic art here, uh, which is associated with destruction of these buildings. And then here's a Masonic parade. These are Masons on parade, and they're dressed uh, like a satanic goat here. They've got these, this, this, this really evil looking almost Halloweenish costume here. And then they got this goat here and then this guy and it looks almost like he's wearing a Shriner Fez or something. This is a little bit closer uh, of it, of this guy riding the goat. And then here are a couple Masonic postcards. Are you a Mason riding the goat? Here's the Mason riding the goat. And then are you a Mason, the Grand Lodge in session? The Grand Lodge in session and every other person is a goat sitting at the table. Okay. So now let's go to the other, uh, the other one. That was outside we could put the pentagram on the ground and have the goat doing the ritual in the middle. Inside we had Solomon's Temple with the Twin Towers, right? So. And I've seen this replicated or pictures of this so many places because in studying Freemasonry, you know, I got uh, a, a friend of mine who knew I was researching all of this. He gave me a stack of, of old Masonic magazines that go back to World War I era, you know, and on the front of them are all these pictures of Masonic temples where you see the same thing that I, what I'm showing you here. So, you know, this is, I, I could show you a hundred pictures, the same as what I'm doing right now. This is, if you're a cultist, this is like, duh, you know, but for the rest of us, we don't live this every day. So that's why, why I'm showing you, you know. Here's the J and the B, Jochum and Boaz, the, the twin towers. And then here's the altar, the Masonic altar. This is the Temple of Solomon right there. And then <laughs> and then this is a Masonic a series of Masonic initiation rituals portrayed and here, these are the initiations as you go up the twin towers with the building behind. And then this is another Masonic piece of art. This is a storm. We've got the Masonic altar and the twin towers there. So, what we've just covered is, is three major symbols of satanic ritual, the pentagram or pentagon, the twin towers, and the goat. Okay. So let's look at the pentagon. Does it have anything connecting it to the occult? Um, very interestingly, and I know that there's out there on the uh, internet and, and I'm sure plenty of people that will stand up and deny that the Pentagon has anything to do with the occult. Um, but consider these interesting facts. It was built on Hell's Bottom. That's the, the name of the place where it, they built it was Hell's Bottom. Wow. Yeah. It was a slum that they had to clear out. <laughs> The people that were building it said 
that they were building it to fit in with the Masonic architect Leigh Enfant's original design in Washington, D.C. I was like, what? If, if you understand how Washington, D.C. was designed by this Freemason, it absolutely blows you away. Uh, I don't think anybody, at one point I was like, you know, if I have the time, I'm going to catalog. There's like 80, 90 different uh, occult symbols built into the, the street plans and the architecture. I mean, the, the beltway that goes around is 666 miles around, you know. Um, the Washington monuments and obelisk, you know, which if you know what an obelisk is from ancient Egypt, um, I won't tell you the anatomical part that that belongs to. Um, but you look at it from the top, and it's a point within a circle, which is a very important Masonic and occult symbol. So, you know, they're trying to build this to, to match the, the original architecture of, whoa, that's like, that's like putting a billboard saying, this is a cult, you know. Now um, I really want to go back to D.C. <laughs> It was intentionally built with lots of fives. Five sides, five acres in, f in an inner court, five floors. And you might say, well, what's five? So what? Five? Five is the satanic number of death. Right? That's very important in Satanism. Five means death. And so they chose five? There's a lot of other symbology, occult symbology here. <laughs> Wait till I get to all of this. But, uh, but you, you might, oh, oh and, and then some people say, well, it was just an accident that it happened that way. No, the original instructions to the man who was building it were very clear. They were written to him, this will not exceed four floors. So what did he do? He built five floors, even though the instructions said only four. So he, he, he just went around his instructions, and the person that signed off on all of this, that approved it all, was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's the Delano family is an ancient Illuminati family, and he was a high-ranking 33rd degree Freemason, so he knew what all this symbology meant. In, fr in fact, it was FDR who chose the exact location of the Pentagon. They wanted, most of the people wanted to put it somewhere else, and he insisted that it be put exactly where it was put. And where the exact location of where it's put is really strange, because remember I was saying that there's all these occult numerologies and all this other stuff? The exact location of where it is fits in with all kinds of occult things. Too many to go into in this talk. It was intentionally built using the ancient megalithic yard, which is 2.722 feet, which was used in Stonehenge. The ancient Druids had a, a unit of measure, and um, the, there's a lot of other hinges in the United Kingdom besides Stonehenge, and they're all built with using that measurement, and that's the measurement that they used in the different links connected to the Pentagon. So it's like they were trying to set up a, a druidic ritual site almost. Um, oh, and then I've got final choice of location designed by Illuminati bloodline Freemason FDR. Also helping him were, was his uncle Frederick Delano and General Brahan Somerville. Now the Masonic 32nd degree, what is its symbol? Is a pentagon. And what, what is that representing? It's re, re, representing a knight, a soldier, who's aspiring. So um, someone who is a Freemason would, would, would look at the Pentagon and see that it symbolizes an aspiring soldier, because if you'd gotten to the 32nd degree anyway. Um, the location and size of the Pentagon forms numerous occult patterns with Washington, D.C. The star formed by the Pentagon is pointing directly at the White House. So there's too many things to say, oh, this was just a coincidence. It is like, hmm, this is beyond coincidence that so many things get built into it, things that wouldn't normally happen. 
I mean, how many of you have built uh, your house using um, the ancient megalithic yard? You know. Um, I heard that they broke ground to start construction on September 11th. The it, it was 60 years before the uh, the the plane supposedly hit it. 60 years exactly on 9-11 was when they started building the Pentagon. There's a lot of little things like that that I don't have worked into my talk because they're just like, it, it, it's like two years ago I gave a talk on the occult numerology behind 9-11. It was like I realized, whoa, I had like several hours of, of material, you know, and that talk is up there on YouTube, I believe, still. So um, I'm not even going to go into a lot of the occult numerology behind 9-11. I'm just talking about the ritual aspects. So there's a lot more behind all of this than I'm even going to get into. Um, and some of you already know a lot of this. You probably know who was controlling the airspace above the Pentagon that day, right? There was a, a command and control a communications aircraft that, that the Air Force uses that uh, is able to control uh, fighters taking off and radar and, and the whole nine yards. And what was its call sign? Its call sign was Venus 77. Well, if you're into the occult, Venus is just another name for, for Lucifer. So we got Lucifer 77 controlling the airspace above. And Venus, what is, what is special about the, uh, Venus? Well, Venus conjuncts, if you're into astrology, it conjuncts with the zodiac to form a pentagram. So there we have the pentagram again. And, okay, and then the Air Force control plane was an E-4B Boeing 747-200 connected to the whole radar network protecting the capital and could have warned people in the Pentagon of danger and could have scrambled warplanes, which are, stay on 24-hour alert, to stop Flight 77. But they didn't. The 77 is a 5, because 7 plus 7 is 14, and 1 and 4 is a 5. Yeah, that makes another 5. There's a lot of 5s in this. The Pentagon lies on the 77th meridian, and the 77 number in the occult for Freemasonry also has a number, another significance. And this goes back to uh, somebody in ancient times. It's associated with the revenge of Lamech, and I'm, I'll read you the scripture behind it. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Lamech was a descendant of the first murderer Cain. Apparently he didn't like the idea that his forefather got, got chastised by God, and so he's like, well, if God, God uh, did, punished him seven times, I'm going to punish 70 times, I'm going to do 70 and sevenfold, 77 times. In other words, I'm going to be badder than God, right? So he named his son Tubal Cain, and he in turn was the forefather of Hiram Abiff. Uh, I, I'm not saying that this actually is the case, but I'm, t I'm telling you Masonic lore is that Hiram Abiff's ancestor was Lemek. And who was Hiram Abiff? He was the person in Masonic lore that designed the Temple of Solomon. See, all this connects. Um, so, Let's look at three Illuminati Satanists here. <laughs> and um, we got Dick Cheney here, and Junior here, and Rumsfeld. They are all three Illuminati Satanists, and I will talk some about them in a minute. Um, this I thought was pretty good. Um, and the, and the larger picture looks like this. Um, it's the same three, Illuminati Satanists. And 
Then we got three more Illuminati Satanists here, Rice and Rumsfeld and Cheney. Rice is looking serious here. This is right after 9-11, they're discussing Iraq. Rice looks serious. He's got a smirk going, and he's sticking his tongue out. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and I'm just going to read so I don't miss anything. I, I wrote down notes on these people. I guess I'll hold this up while I talk about them. Dick Cheney, an Illuminati Satanist, a really pure, purely evil man. He played a lead role in the Bush administration's 9-11 response and war on terror. Recognized as the most powerful vice president in U.S. history, a part-time handler for George Bush Jr., who, by the way, has there's uh, trauma-based mind control. I, I wrote a series of books on the Illuminati's mind control, and George Bush is a, a multiple personality who's programmed with that mind control. And one of his handlers was Cheney. Um, the Cheney family is related to seven U.S. presidents, and Dick Cheney is related to President Truman and President Obama by the common ancestor, Marine Duval. When he attended Yale, he flunked out twice. Brigham Young University gave him an honorary doctorate. He is very heavily guarded all the time. He's been a director of the Council of Foreign Relations, the CEO chairman, and, uh, chairman of the Board of Halliburton, and vice president and board of advisors of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, He's very involved with trauma-based mind control, and he works a lot with the Saudi royal family. Donald Rumsfeld here was the Secretary of Defense. He is an Illuminati member and participates in many of their organizations, including the Bilderbergers, Bohemian Grove, Rand Chairman, Bechtel Corporation, Board of Trustees of the Hoover Institute, he was the U.S. ambassador to NATO. He led the campaign to legalize aspartame. How many knew that? I mean, these people are in all kinds of stuff. All of these people are involved with the pharmaceuticals, you know? It's like, what? Eli, Eli Lilly and, and all these other, you, you, you think they're just involved in politics. They also are, are running the pharmaceuticals, you know? What? Say what? Um, all three of these men, in fact all four of them, all of these people knew ahead of time that 9-11 was going to happen. And, um, and, and Rumsfeld, right after it happened, that afternoon, right like that. I mean, picture this. I mean, imagine, I, I go, I'm sure all of you remember what was going on with you the day of 9-11, right? I do. It was like JFK's assassination. is a trauma memory. I remember exactly what happened that whole day. What was Rumsfeld doing? He turned right around after attack and started ordering his staff to find evidence that a rock was behind 9-11. Now, what, what is wrong with that picture? Because if, some, if this had been a real attack, that a real foreign enemy had done to the United States, what would you be doing as Secretary of Defense? You would be, you wouldn't know who it was, and you would be trying to find out who the real, real criminal organization was, right? Could be some renegade Japanese organization. But you wouldn't turn right around and say, okay, let's go after a rock. You see what I mean? You would feel it was your duty to find the real criminal, not well, let's find, he was telling his staff, let's find evidence to go to war against a rock. What's that show you? That's just another smoking gun. that This guy was part of it, right? And then uh, we got a memo on November 27th where he's asking his aides in the memo, how can we start a war with a rock? He's still on this, let's start a war with a rock thing. But boy, they started within minutes of 9-11 uh, going after a rock. Okay, Kundalizi Rice, I want to say Kundalina, um, was National Security Advisor, 
when 9-11 happened. She's been the director for Chevron, Carnegie Corporation, important roles in the Rand Corporation, Hoover Institute. She's also in the Council of Foreign Relations and Illuminati. Let's look at five again. We're going back to the Pentagon. Five means death. Five, 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 right? Six, six, six is the highest of man, right? Triple six, 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 six is the highest of man. Five, 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 the highest of death, right? So who's the head of the military? You've got five pointed star, you've got five of them arranged in a, in a, a pentagon. Five, 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 right? Right, five star general, he's the head of death in this country. So knowing that, that 555 is the ultimate of death, how many people do you think would be killed at the Pentagon? You're right, 555. 125 people were killed at the Pentagon, which is five to the third power, five times five times five. Isn't that amazing? And as you know, a lot of you, because you're researchers or you, you've been listening to researchers, you know, anybody who's, who's a sincere researcher in 9-11 realizes there was no plane that hit the Pentagon, right? This Flight 77 didn't hit it. Um, likewise, we didn't have planes hit the Twin Towers. So the point I'm making is, is these numbers that they made up for the flights, they, they, made, they chose these numbers themselves. So why did they choose 7-7? We're going to get into that. Why, why did they have 125 people die? They chose these numbers. Okay, they're ritual numbers. Okay, let's switch over to the other ritual. Or, as maybe you haven't um, already accepted that, that it was a ritual, the possible ritual that was taking place up in New York City with Flight 11 and Flight 175 hitting the Twin Towers of Bo, uh, uh, Yoam and Boaz. And what was the building behind the Twin Towers? Building 7 was known as Solomon's Building. You see there? We had our Temple of Solomon with the Twin Towers. Solomon Brothers were located in Building 7. And what was Building 7? It was more than just a building. It was the headquarters. It was where they had uh, Giuliano, we're going to talk about him, the mayor of, of New York City had placed the emergency response headquarters in that building. So it was the headquarters. It was, it was literally this whole thing is, is set up like a ritual with Building 7. And what was the design of Building 7? Anybody aware of how it was designed? It was in the shape of a trapezoid. How many people have built a building in the shape of a trapezoid? That's a very bizarre shape. And the, uh, the leaders of the Church of Satan are called the Order of the Trapezoid. Interesting. So they build a trapezoid. We're going to get into the person who built that, Silverstein. Um, we're going to get into him in a, in a minute. But here we have a trapezoidal building called Solomon's Building with the Twin Towers in front. This is not ordinary stuff, people. Um, Uh, let's see, which way shall I go on this? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, quote some here. Yeah, I got some. I'm going to quote some from Crowley. Aleister Crowley, probably a lot of you already are familiar with who he is. He was, he's looked up to by Satanists. In fact, there's more to this story. Um, <laughs> she's shaking her head, yes. There's more to this. Now, I can't confirm this. I'm just going to pass this on to you as what people have alleged. But Barbara Bush, George Jr.'s mom, is 
said to be, and she looks a lot like Aleister Crowley, she's said to be his daughter. That uh, um, Anyway, Aleister Crowley uh, is looked up to by Satanists. He wrote all of these uh, books talking about rituals and how to do this and how to do this. Uh, Moonchild, you know, I know that his, his material is used um, because like one of the rituals that's done in the trauma-based mind control for the Illuminati is the Moonchild ceremonies where they demonize the fetus, which was, which he writes about. He's got a book, Moonchild. So his stuff is actually used by Satanists. And um, Crowley says that number 11 is the, is the number of magic. It is good for any kind of magical operation. So that would be the perfect number for, to name a flight, a, a notional flight, nominal, that's going to hit uh, one of the Twin Towers. Lieber, 175, which is one of his books, is the number of a ritual to invoke any deity by adoration. So it would be the perfect uh, number for invoking whatever deity you wanted. So both of those numbers are powerful satanic numbers. They just happen to be the numbers that they named those no pretend flights that never hit the, the Twin Towers. Well, what's 7-7? Seven, seven? This is very important because remember what had to be inside the pentagram. Remember what I've been stressing? Is the goat, right? The goat is inside the pentagram, right? What does 7-7 seven, seven represent? 7-7, seven, 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 if you go to Crowley's information, he'll tell you it represents a couple things. One is it re represents a mature uh, level of magic, but it also represents the goat of Mendes. It represents the goat of the Sabbath on an altar. Wow! So by using the, the number 7-7 seven, seven in the um, Venus 77 or, or Venus Lucifer 77, we're talking about a goat. By having flight 77 hit there, we're referring to the goat. The goat in the pentagram, right? The goat goes into the pentagram. Wow, I mean, that's, that's the perfect ritual, right? That's what, that's what they say. You, you have to have that, you want that goat in the pentagram. That's exactly what they did. Um, if, I was, if I was a Satanist, I would be going like, whoa, they're telling me this is an inside job. I mean, this would be like somebody saying, uh, I believe in John 3.16. You know, well, well, what would you assume from that? That he's a Christian, right? Somebody's saying, you know, we're, we're sticking the goat in the pentagram. What are you going to assume? He's, he's a Satanist. This has got the, all the earmarks of being sat a Satanic ritual. But, you know, I'm not saying that 100%. I'm letting you draw your own conclusions. Um, the New York Times, right after this happened, on their headline, which was kind of, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but their, their caption was, uh, for the 9-11 story was, a creeping whore. And I thought, that sounds like Halloween. You know, a creeping whore? What a strange, I don't know, it's just maybe that's just me, but it just sounded like, this is like something out of Halloween, calling it, a, titling the story to 9-11, a creeping whore? I don't know. It's not the title I would have come up with. Um, 77 is, also represents power. And what's the Pentagon? The Pentagon represents power. Now let's go back to what I was talking about earlier. So we were, we were talking about ritual sites, and I was getting ready to go back to what we originally talked about. We talked about, in general, they pick sacred spots. 
Now, is the Pentagon a sacred spot? In several ways. One is, as we already saw, that they kind of set it up as a Druidic location using these ancient Druid, the, uh, Druid uh, yard. But also, if we think in terms of the American people, the Pen Pentagon was a very sacred symbol for us. And it was the, the symbol of the military, right? Whenever they would come out with newspaper articles about the, what the military wants to say, they would say, the Pentagon says this. It was a symbol of America's power. And what was the symbol of our economic power? The Twin Towers, right? So they were both symbols. They were both sacred to the American people. So they had a, a sacredness beyond just a cult sacredness. They had meaning to the, uh, the world at large. And then, of course, we have seen the, the uh, patterns there uh, replicated not only within uh, their satanic ceremonies, but replicated in the events of 9-11. So we had, we had these two flights here, but we also had a flight coming across like this, Flight 83. And so, uh, as, as we have discussed, probably all of these flights were just uh, what actually happened was not at all what we were told. Um, flight, excuse me, I meant to say 93. Flight 93 just disappeared into the ground. It, uh, it hit the ground, and then they said that there was a hole there, and it just disappeared le without leaving a trace. Um, that, that was in Pennsylvania, at Shanksville, Pennsylvania, which is kind of an interesting play on words, too, because the, uh, 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 you probably thought about this, the, the hijackers were using Shanks, so the plane goes down in Shanksville. <laughs> but anyway, um, what does 93 mean in terms of Satanism? Well, that is very interesting because it is a code word for um, do what thou wilt, which is a satanic proverb. But when Satanists within, uh, when, when they go to write a letter, a message, like Aleister Crowley, what he would do is, is he would write 93 at the top of the message and at the end of the message, he had write 9393, 93, the end of message. So 93 means that a message is going to be sent, right? So what's the story about Flight 93? The story of Flight 93 is, is that the passengers revolted, and, the, and one of them got on a cell phone and called and said, let's roll. And that let's roll became the battle cry for the shock and awe invasion of Iraq. They put it on jet air fighters, uh, air force fighters. They put it on military vehicles. They put it on t-shirts, on jerseys, on fire trucks. Let's roll. It became the battle cry of 9-11. In fact, right after this whole thing happened, within hours, uh, Bush was saying, that's the battle cry of 9-11. The message, let's roll. And they, they named that flight, Flight 93. Very interesting. Um, it also has the meaning, too, for the AA, which is a branch of the Illuminati. It's the secret, 93 stands for their secret word for someone who gets an, uh, initiated, the new candidate. So it's linked to Satanism, 93. Um, and, and so then after giving us that drama of the passenger revolt, the plane mysteriously hits the ground and goes into a hole, a mine shaft supposedly leaving us no trace. Um, now there was one other flight besides the four that we've talked about. So far all of these numbers uh, the 
you know, and we know that, that the flights didn't exist, so we know that they had to come up with the numbers for, off the top of their head. So it's very interesting that these numbers all pick the satanic theme of what those flights were about, right? Well, there was one other flight besides the four that we've mentioned, and that was Flight 85. And what's the story of that? Well, first, let, what does 85 mean in Satanism? It relates to opening the mouth ceremony. 85 represents the mouth, opening the mouth. What was the opening the mouth ceremony? Back in ancient Egypt, in the mystery religion back there, when you had the mummy, you opened his mouth. Okay? It stands for words, opening the mouth. Well, what happened, oh, and it also represents when Shiva wakes up, Shiva, you know who Shiva is from um, the Hinduism, the goddess of destruction, and when she wakes up and destroys the old structures, it also represents war, or the destruction of the old structure and bringing in through that destruction a purification of new. Okay, that's what 85 represents. So what was 80, uh, Flight 85? Well, Flight 85 was coming out of Anchorage, and they scrambled a couple jets that went up beside it, and they ordered the pilot, which there was no hijackers on the plane, but they ordered the pilot to radio the signal that he was being hijacked and forced it down. So they opened the pilot's mouth and showed through this that, okay, we're going, we're going to open his mouth and, and this is war. We've got our war jets up there. We'll shoot him down if he doesn't come down. Wow! Once again, we see the numbers of these flights match uh, the satanic meaning of what, what they were involved with. And what was happening while all of this was going on? Well, our president was down in Sarasota, Florida, and, uh, which is an interesting place too because it's a CIA town. And those of you who are familiar with my work on uh, MKUltra, MKUltra was the CIA form of the Illuminati's trauma-based mind control. And the CIA has been very active in performing mind control, trauma-based mind control for the Illuminati. And so this elementary school that George Bush was, was in, elementary class he was in, the students were probably, I'm going to conjecture on this uh, since I don't know, but since judging from the, the place where it happened, there were probably a lot of um, mind controlled uh, uh, kids that had been subjected to this Illuminati trauma-based mind control. Anyway, they had the kids chanting while George Bush is reading this book, and um, they are chanting out the story. And what was the story about? It's about this pet goat. And the, the book is an allegory about Satan, because um, you've got the evil father who's an authority figure and the goat in the story is the hero of the book, and, um, and the goat is the savior. And interestingly, when they walk in to tell them about the 9-11 the disaster, you probably all are familiar with what George Bush did when they told him that, hey, the Twin Towers are being uh, hit and, and people are dying. What, what did he do? He kept reading the Ode to the Goat. Why was it important to keep reading the, this Ode to the Goat? Because that's part of the ceremony. This, they were, this was the ritual paying homage to the goat, Satan, the goat of Mendes. That's why he, he, could have, he could have just, you know, done something like this and gotten up and left the class. Excuse me, kids. No, he kept reading this the story of the goat hero, the goat being the hero. So there we have the elements going back to 
what we, were, we talked about earlier, what are the elements of a ritual? You're going to give, you're going to give the symbols, you're going to have the symbols, you're going to be doing it at a sacred uh, site, you're going to be giving worship, all the elements are there. And what did they want to do at, the, at the, where the, the plane 93 went into the ground and disappeared? They wanted to build a memorial there. And what was the shape of the memorial that they proposed? No, it was a crescent. But what does the crescent represent? It represents the joking side of Freemasonry. This is a Shriner, and the Crescent, Crescent is, they're the jokesters of Freemasonry. And so when I saw that they were going to propose a Crescent uh, memorial there where the plane disappeared, it was like, huh, they're laughing at us. They're laughing at us. Okay, I'm, I'm reading uh, just straight from... Um, this is just a, 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 a burial ritual for the occult. We all come from the goddess, and to her we shall return, like a drop of rain falling to the ocean, all that falls shall rise again. And to the east, we welcome the spirits of the ancestors. To the south, we welcome our heroes and inspirations. To the west, we welcome the ancestors to incarnate in our children. To north, we welcome our deaths. Uh, that sounds so much like the way that they were talking after this whole thing happened, you know. Welcoming our heroes. Um, the whole thing, you know. Um, falling to the ocean. You know, falling. Planes falling down. It, it just, wow. The way they were talking. Um, so now let's go to one other thing involved here. Why 9-11? I mean, there's all kinds of occult symbolism in 9-11. I'm not trying to say that I'm going to exhaust that subject. But I'm going to throw something new out uh, for you. If we go back, this is, you can do this on the computer. This is for Bethlehem, 11th September, 3 BC. And you see the astrological... Uh, alignment there. There's a, a Dr. Heiser and there's other astrologers that um, um, have gone back and looked. What was the star that the wise men were following? And when did that star happen? The star announcing Christ's birth aligned on September 11th, 3 BC. So what a better day to have a black mass where you're going to kill a whole bunch of people to Lucifer than on Christ's birthday. Now, I don't know if that's actually Christ's birthday or not, but astrologically, um, where you have Regus and Leo lining up with King of Kings, it, it, uh, it, one could make a good case for that. And definitely, since the Illuminati's into astrology, I'm sure that they have, they're familiar with uh, the, the concept of um, uh, September 11th, uh, 3 BC being Christ's birthday. Wow. Wow. Okay. Let's uh, discuss a little bit about the military. Um, someone who visited with me, who sat in on an Illuminati military meeting for high-ranking army officers, he, what he was basically conveying to me, amongst other things, besides talking about what went on in the meeting, meeting was I got the uh, understanding that there's a lot of high-ranking officers in the military that are Illuminati. And we look at the Department of Defense and the State Department, they're both heavily loaded with Illuminati. Leading NATO officers, Joint Chiefs of Staff are often Illuminati. And so, what's interesting is, is in 1962, the Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on a false flag operation called Operation Northwoods. What was that operation to be? 
The false flag was to be created by hijacking planes and then blowing up a U.S. ship to get us into the war with Cuba. And why did that not happen? It's because JFK said, no, no way. Here's the front page of the North Wind operation declassified um, that they had planned. If John F. Kennedy hadn't stood in their way, we'd have gotten a false flag similar to 9-11 back in 1962. Yeah, exactly, Limitzer, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Operation North Wind? North Wind. Yeah. They were going to remote control flight plane and attack Cuba, right? But it's by, it's by remote control. Oh, was it? Oh, you're ahead of me. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, earlier that year, the CIA had decided to hire someone who was a, an investment banker. This is very interesting. Um, his name was A.B. Buzzy Krongard, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this too. I mean, the Europeans are more familiar with this than the Americans because, because the Europeans have been screaming loudly that uh, the whole 9-11 thing reeks because these people were making millions of dollars off of it on the stock market. So he was the head of Alexander Brown and Company, an investment bank. He had a $4 million salary, and he gave that up to, to uh, be hired by the CIA for uh, sensibly a, a piddly uh, salary. And um, when they interviewed him, he said, well, if you go back to the CIA's origins, the whole OSS was really nothing but Wall Street bankers and lawyers. So the, the CIA has used their intelligence operations to make money. And they, they used him because it was his company that they used to make millions of dollars off of the 9-11 tragedy. So the CIA obviously knew quite a, 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 quite a while before things that, uh, that they needed to do these put options on United and American Airlines stocks so that they could make all these millions um, ahead of time. Now, let's look at another person involved in all this, Rudy Giuliano. I'm not pronouncing the name, I didn't pronounce, I just, Giuliani. <laughs> there you go. He was the mayor of New York City during 9-11. His brother-in-law was an organized crime. He grew up in Catholic. He grew up a Catholic, but he's real secretive about his religious beliefs, and I I understand why. He's a gay cross dresser, so um, before and be, so you wouldn't really want to announce what your your actual beliefs are if you're a politician. A lot of people before 9/11 thought of him as an ambitious politician. After 9-11, he was elevated to a hero, and he was on Time Magazine as Person of the Year in 2001 for how he handled the 9-11 thing. He obviously was a team player with these people. I don't know if he himself is, is Illuminati, but he was obviously a team player with these people. And um, it was his decisions that led to the large diesel tanks being placed in Building 7, and it was his decisions that uh, meant that the, that the emergency radios in that building were defective, so that the emergency uh, personnel were, were ended up uh, hampered by defective radios. Um, so I don't know how much he knew or whether he was Illuminati, but he certainly went along with the whole fla false flag thing. He's a team player, and he he attacked Ron Paul's thoughts on 9-11. Um, you know, Ron Paul was saying that we invited the 9-11 attacks, which is a little strange thing, but then, then uh, Rudy was, was, then went and attacked that. So, Larry Silverstein, he was another uh, player in all of this. 
He was the leaseholder of the World Trade Center buildings, and he was the one who built Building 7. You know, that trapezoid building that, we, that was called Solomon's building. His father was a Ukrainian Jew. Um, Silverstein made out like a bandit from 9-11, although it took him six years before he got an insurance settlement of, uh, of $4.55 billion. If you realize that he only paid uh, thousands to get that condemned building, he made out like a bandit. And you flo uh, floating over here to another sheet of paper, Chief Judge John Mercer Walker, who ruled on Silverstein Properties insurance claim, was a relative of President Bush and a member of the Skull and Bones. So everything gets to stay in the family. At the time of 9-11, Silverstein controlled 10 million square feet and 13 buildings in New York City. He had a regular habit of eating breakfast on top of the World Trade Center North Tower, but he didn't on the day of 9-11. He was obviously in on the false flag operation. I don't know if he knew about the ritual aspect. I believe he's Israeli intelligence, and Israeli intelligence was warning certain people like a Jewish company in the trade center was warned and their people didn't go to work, work that day. Uh, here's another member of the Order of Skull and Bones. Like I said, George Bush appointed 11 of his bonesmen to, to his administration. Now, I don't know if he took his, his role, the best I could find out, you know, there's still a lot that I don't know, but in September, I don't know if it was September before 9-11 or after 9-11, he became the assistant attorney general under Bush. Uh, this is Robert McCallum, Jr., and uh, he's also uh, Illuminati. Um, you know, his wife was a casualty of the main Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that, yeah, that's right. He relates to the whole thing, too. Um, and then his new wife, surprisingly, looks like her, um, but with a different name. Leave some time for questions. What's the guy's name? Okay. Robert D. McCallum, Jr.? I think Jr. Oh, okay. Um, um, there's, I'll show what Tex Mars did here. Um, he has, and there's a lot of pictures of him doing this. It's not, it's not like something that's, out of the ordinary. Here's George Bush doing his, his little hand signal, uh, goat head sing, uh, goat horn signal, and Kerry doing his one eye thing, you know, the one eye of the Illuminati that's so popular. Uh, Kerry's also the Order of Skull and Bones. So, you know, they, they like to uh, do their little satanic signs. Yeah? Right, and the guy that I just showed you here was his uh, uh, roommate, uh, was, was George Bush's roommate. So it's, it's a small world at the top. Robert McCallum, uh, McCallum, M-C-C-A-L-L-U-M. Um, -L -L He's junior, he's got a father with the same name. Um, so, just reading you uh, some quick quotes here. Um, September 7th, NBC Meet the Press, Vice President Cheney accused Saddam of moving aggressively to be develop nuclear weapons over the past 14 months. And then uh, on a different station, CNN, which CNN was started by the CIA, by the way. Uh, National Security Advisor Rice said, that regarding the likelihood of Iraq obtaining nuclear weapons, we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. So they're already right before 9-11 planting the seeds, you know, of, 
of, oh, a rock's the bad guy. And then after it happens, you just see them hammering, oh, a rock's to blame for this, a rock's to blame to, for this. You know, September 12, 2001, former terrorism advisor Richard Clark personally informed the president that neither Saddam Hussein nor Iraq was responsible for the September 11 attacks. On September 18th, Clark submitted to President National Security Advisor Rice a memo he had written in response to George W. Bush's specific request that stated, one, the case for linking Hassam to the September 11th attack was weak. He, he told her only anecdotal evidence linked to Hussein, Hussein to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden resented the secularism of Saddam Hussein and there was no confirmed reporting of Saddam Hussein cooperating with bin Laden. So you have people who are intelligent and informed, they're telling them, hey, there's no connection and yet at the same time you have this, you just have Bush and, and Rumsfeld and Cheney just hammering in the press, it's a rock, it's a rock, you know. So we got, here, here's a um, a speech on President Bush, May 1st, 2003. The Battle of Iraq is one victory in a war on terror that began on September the 11th, 2001 and still goes on. That terrible morning, 19 evil men, the shock troops of the hateful ideology, gave America and the civilized world a glimpse of their ambitions. They imagined in the words of one terrorist that September the 11th would be the beginning of the end of America. By seeking to turn our cities into killing fields, terrorists and their allies believed that they could destroy this nation's resolve and force our retreat from the world. They have failed. So, you know, lies. Just lies and lies. They, we have a ritual where they sacrificed to Lucifer and then blamed it on the, uh, Bin Laden. Oh, and that... And that's interesting too, because uh, let's see if I can find here. Um, what's Bin Laden got to do with this? Well, if I've got, if I've got the, uh, did I bring that sheet of paper? There's in the mystery religions. Um, remember the the uh, at Gibraltar, the the towers there, the the Hercules. Well, the, the um, mythology around that was that uh, Hercules went to and went, and he uh, I know, wish I could find that. The ritual is that he uh, the, the, the character there that, that gets blamed for it is Laden. And bin Laden means son of Laden. So it's like this whole script also is goes with this mystery religion story. So it's like they took a mystery religion story and remember Illuminati are, are the continuation of the mystery religions and they worked up this mystery religion story into this whole script. It's like wow. This is like they really did it. Uh, they really outdid themselves on putting all of this script together. And you know that back in 1988, um, that was another thing that I had here, was an article. I brought along an article um, that this guy wrote. He was, he was right after they had built uh, the World Trade Center buildings, he was in there as a photographer, and then it's a long story, but they kind of mistook him for some other workers. And anyway, he was sitting in, listening to all of this, and, and he was talking to these people, and what he discovered was, is they knew back then that the buildings were condemned, that they were gonna have to be destroyed because they couldn't stand. So back in 1988, they realized that they were going to have to destroy these buildings, but the problem was, is destroying these new buildings was going to cost more than anyone could do. So you see in the early 90s, they start 
uh, doing what some people call predictive programming. They start having through uh, cartoons and, and movies and everything, showing the World Trade Center being uh, destroyed by planes hitting it or whatnot. They're, start, they're starting to show us back early in the 90s, and I showed some of that in my talk two years ago. So they knew clear back in 1988 that they were going to have to destroy these buildings. So this, they've had a long time. They had a long time to work this whole script up. And um, I'm sure that some of them were very proud of what they did. And I think that's a good place to stop and open it up to questions. There, and wasn't there also something with the foundations? It, it was not stable. Um, the, the buildings were not uh, structurally sound either. Um, they were too high for the foundation. Exactly. That was built for. It was only built exactly. for like a, a 35 story building, and these things were like. Exactly. The foundations were not sufficient to hold it. And you realize that that whole area used to be swamp, basically. And then. Underlying at the deep level is granite, so that it, it did attach into granite, but in spite of the fact that they attached the foundation some way to granite, and they built these retaining walls to keep out the water, and they had all of these tunnels, uh, uh, moving trains and stuff, and they had to have all of these systems for water management and everything. In spite of all of that, they had really, really worked hard, but but when the inspectors came in and looked at it, they had condemned the buildings. And they said that you're, uh, you're, you're going to have to tear them down. And so that's why Silverstein was able to buy them pennies on the dollar, because they were condemned buildings. And he would not have bought them unless he knew that there was going to be, that they were going to be part of this false flag. So he was in on it from the start. Um, like you see, you know, Israeli intelligence knew that, um, that this was going to happen. So he was one of the people on the inside knowing that it was going to happen. But I don't know that whether he knew about the ritual aspect or not. Yes? Would you say that those buildings and, um, were built knowing that they're going to be destroyed from the very beginning? Because all the symbolism is there. That's an interesting question. The question is could the buildings have been built intentionally to take down? That's a good question. I, I do know that uh, um, this Illuminati card game, which I got circa 1995, and I was absolutely blown away because it was like the guy who put this card game, it was like he even surpassed what my books were saying. But he showed, he showed the Twin Towers being destroyed in the card game. It's the, the name of the game is Illuminati, you know. And he showed the Twin Towers being destroyed. But, but so, so the, the people in the new, uh, no, knew, you know, long before it happened. But I don't, I don't know of any evidence that specifically points before 1988. Does anybody know of any evidence that, that, that this was do you? Well, no, I, I heard that the builders said that it could have sustained uh, multiple uh, uh, planes on that size. It, it oh, yeah, as far as that goes, yes, because back years ago, being a history buff, uh, or a historian, actually, I should say historian, and um, I actually had in my hands the New York Times newspaper that was the day after a military bomber flew into the Empire State Building. In World War II, uh, a B-25 um, was, was flying in fog and didn't even realize that there was the Empire State Building in front of it and flew full speed, boom, 
right into the building. That was 1948. Was it 1948? Oh, I, I, thought it, I thought it was World War II, but I stand corrected. At any rate, the point I'm making here is, is what happened to the Empire State Building? Nothing. And nothing. Nothing happened. It was like it wasn't even scratched, you know? Um, I, I think so, there's sacred geometries, of what, what they call the geometries when you take a look at uh, where the Pentagon is in relation to the Twin Towers, in relation to the White House, that there uh, is some numerology involved in its location. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, don't know about, um, I, I was under the impression that it may have actually been built to uh, be sacrificed at some point. Which building? The Pentagon or the Twin Towers? The, the Twin Towers. But the, sure. the, you know, the, the possibility exists there. That's the, until we get some kind of evidence that they knew, knew uh, about the Twin Towers going to be destroyed prior to, to them being built, and I haven't seen anything to, uh, like that. Um, but that's a good thing, a good question, and, and the reason why I, I also mention that is this guy who was an eyewitness to th this high-level military Illuminati meeting, he said that they, they went and they talked about 10-year plans, 20-year plans, 40-year plans, and they had these things planned out like 40 years ahead of time. So, um, so I could categorically say that they had something planned, but whether it was specifically those buildings, I don't know. Um, yes, Anne. Okay, I've got two questions. One, if there's so much symbology and all that, was there another reason or any evidence that they were going into Iraq to find some sort of symbol or something? Remember, they raided all of these places that had artifacts and so forth. Is there anything that you might have been after there that has uh, come out in the press? Now, my second question is, what about Rabbi Khan's harbinger theory, or, you know, what he is coming out with from Old Testament and some other things regarding uh, New York City and this whole thing, uh, as uh, Harbingers explains? I'm not familiar with that, but, yeah, uh, that gets back into... Why do things happen? And things can happen for many different reasons. I mean, what they used the war in Iraq for, besides going in and making themselves wealthy, and, and besides creating this war on terror, which, which by the way, I, I, I'm going to interrupt myself. I was flying in 1995, circa 1995 or 96. Um, and I was in an American airport, sitting there just like you are. And off to my left-hand side, I started hearing a conversation. And there was a woman, and she was, she was speaking with authority. You know, she knew what she was talking about. She's not, she wasn't speculating, but she was telling this other lady, this is what's going to happen. There is going to be a terrorist event. And then, there, then the American people are going to be subjected to going through um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the screening, um, what do you call the machines? The, um, and she was, she was outlining it. She was gloating. She was pleased. I mean, to listen to this lady, I thought she was probably a Satanist or something. She was creepy. It was creepy, but she was, she was excited that the American people were going to be put in their place and that they were going to be subjected to all of this um, at the airports, and it was going to happen after a, a terrorist event. So, you know, uh, again, that was another thing. Now, what did, they, what did they do? When they went into Iraq, this relates back to Nimrod, and uh, if you go back into uh, Antichrist prophecies and who the Antichrist and the Antichrist bloodlines and everything. And then all this stuff disappears from the museums that relates to the, the Antichrist. So it's like, this is, this is another thing. So they used, they used the war in Iraq to do that agenda too. Um, uh, 
who, who uh, what was your name, sir? Bud. Bud? Bud. Uh, question. Unless we all forget the uh, World Trade Center was att attempted back in 92, 93. Yeah, 93. And it was a, uh, I think the outcome, in fact, OPB did a documentary on that. And I can't recall the name of the individual who was in front of that. But the focus and the main spokesman was Buck Rebell of the FBI. And it was later revealed that 93 was a sting operator. But it was one of these contrived situations like that. Last episode we had down there with the Arab brother who was supposed to blow up the Christmas tree and all that. <laughs> they, the FBI, and that, there was footage in a warehouse showing them uh, the alleged uh, failure, mixing the bomb, mixing the soup, the whole thing. And the agency, whether they want to take the credit for it as a, one of those uh, contrived uh, situations, that's what the documentary pointed out. And then, of course, at the end of the documentary, the narrator was standing at the World Trade Center with his profile in the back of and his statement was, this is, this, this, they will try this again. This was 93. I think it's just basically yeah. an intelligence operation. In this yeah, they were definitely priming the pump by getting us, okay, you do this, this in 93, now people are, are uh, start thinking, okay, the World Trade Center is a target for terrorists, you know, and get us thinking that direction. Um, so that's, that goes all back to what I was saying earlier. For a ritual, hypnotism is used a lot. And so a lot of the things that were done in 9-11 pertain to hypnotism, how they, like, like when you were watching the television when they were showing you right after it happened i mean immediately as this thing was happening the the they're showing you the planes hitting the uh, the the plane hitting the the tower and right from the beginning they were saying this looks like the work of osama bin laden what is that that's a hypnotic suggestion you see what i mean right there from the start it made me really disgusted because you know, you flip to all three channels and they were all saying the same thing. It looks like the work of Osama bin Laden. It could have been a thousand different uh, um, sources of, of what, who was behind it, but they were planting the hypnotic suggestion. So hypnotism comes into play, and this is a very much a magic trick, which I was thinking about that too in preparing this talk, about all of the different magical things that they used, you know, slide of hands, get your attention over here. So there's a lot of magic involved in this too, along with hypnosis. Um, let's see, before I go to you, Greg, this gentleman here, yeah, um, Gordon. About, uh, you said that you didn't think planes hit the buildings? Right, if you look at the film of the planes going in, you actually see that it was photoshopped. They just have the planes, it's just a film. And all of the, the few witnesses that actually claim to have seen it, they're all um, dirty. You know, they're all uh, people that were working for, for, you know, we don't have any real witnesses that saw planes go through. And then people, once you see it on television, you know, why? Well, it happened, you know. It's solidified in your mind, you know. But when you actually look at the film, and, and maybe some of you can talk about this better than I. Um, it, the, the plane comes, just right it just seamlessly in. goes right in. You can see it was photoshopped, not even professionally. It was kind of crudely done. Um, so there, there weren't even two planes hitting. That was all just uh, notional, nominal um, stuff. So that's why the significance of the, the, the flight numbers, because that tells us not just people don't believe that planes hit the World Trade Center because they've watched it on TV. There were eyewitnesses. Yeah, York and City. all of those eyewitnesses that have come through. Actually, I'm from New York City. I sold real estate along uh, uh, okay. 7th and 8th Avenue. Okay. And uh, person after person that bought apartments from me, they were saying they were, you know, when they felt something happen, and I agree that planes did not hit the buildings, but there were planes that moved. Oh, they fly by there were some planes that flew by. They saw the planes. They were oh, yeah. Oh yeah, 
true. There were some planes that flew by at that they time. Might, point might that, but obviously, like, just so to give some credence to these oh. people and that they're not all oh. great, like, there was a lot of people. Yeah, the, that's true. There were some, there were some planes, but the, the footage that they showed on television is just fakery. You're, you're right. And it, and it would make sense because if they had planned a demolition, they wouldn't want the explosions to be interrupted for that, um, you know, for the, the, sequence. the, 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 the <coughs> sequenced explosions, right? So, you know, they would need to have one fly in, but not it. Well, also, and there, the, the, there was no plane that struck the Pentagon, and there was no plane that struck Shanksville. So why, you know, that also gives credibility no planes strike in the World Trade Center. And um, when people see, they believe. Now it takes some time, uh, sometimes to uh, to transmit uh, motion pictures or films or whatever from one place to a studio. And but if you're going to show people the events happening, it sure is handy to have it ahead of time. And, and then you know for sure you're going to be able to show it on television and people are going to see what you want them to see. I think you wag the dog. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, you know, besides the um, videos and photos of uh, planes hitting the towers, which are in question, um, if you look at the highly detailed High definition photography of particularly um, the second plane hitting the towers. Um, what I don't see is any um, plane debris, except maybe one possible example, flying out of the building. And you know that's really an anomaly because um, the the fuel tank for a, a big jet air, airliner is in the wing just underneath the fuselage. If that explodes, and you know, apparently that big flame explosion we saw in the second uh, impact was the explosion of that fuel tank, well, that should have propelled a lot of plane debris out of the building. Mm -hmm. But these high definition photos of that explosion show none. Show none. Mm -hmm. All exactly. they show is the cladding of the building, you know, the uh, uh, aluminum exterior being blown off in little pieces. Lots of that, it's like confetti. But I've looked in vain for any plane debris in that. Um, do you think that uh, that was picked up? Are, are we picking up what people in the audience are saying? Okay, good. Otherwise, I was going to repeat what Greg had said. Very good point, Greg. Um, let's see, it seemed like there was a, okay. Uh, Carl. In the final summary of things, we've been taught all our lives that this is one nation under God. <laughs> <laughs> Not the God that we thought, huh? <laughs> Good point. Good point. It might be that the God has now changed. The those that are in power now. Exactly. It's it's uh, it can go both ways there. Greg. Give me the update on that uh, engine part, I guess, that was found in an alley last, what, year or two? Uh, that it's claimed to have come from one of the aircraft. The news I was going to free. Because uh, there's the, uh, of course, I suspect that it's going to be able to explain it in some kind of a story. I thought that someone here might have the, uh, the other one. Well, I, I don't know about a specific identification. And of course, any specific identification from the federal government is suspect. But if you know that that, that little alley, which is really just a cleft between two buildings, um, was on, on one side was the alleged site of this proposed um, mosque uh, close to, uh, 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 you know, was so it, it was actually the discovery of that plane part was adding to that little controversy, which I think is itself a, uh, a kind of false flag. 
All right, so it, it was implicated then in the controversy of whether or not the uh, we were going to permit the sighting of the house, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask about, does anybody know the truth about this uh, story that Daddy Bush was actually having a, a breakfast with members of the Vermont family when, when this demolition project occurred and, and that they were spirited out of the country when, when all aircraft was grounded uh, safely and, and, and quickly? I thought it was Jamie who had a, who was having breakfast with one of the, with one of the, I thought it was her walker. Who's that? That's mine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I want to answer this guy's question. Is part of an operation is to keep the myth alive. So it's always, they're going to find something. I personally don't think it was Apollo. We landed on the moon. But every so often, they have to show, oh, here's some Japanese photos. They went and just photographed it. So, you know, a part of the operation is because they have so much invested in the myth, you know? They have to have a revision department. Right, they have to re revise it. And, oh, we found this piece and we found that piece. And that proves it happened, you know? Yeah. It's like they, you reestablish the lie. They just come up with a bigger lie, mm -hmm. you know? Go ahead. Uh, that's that's true. I mean, that's as true as we can figure it to be. Uh, yeah, Bush was having a, a, a session with members of the Bin family. When all aircraft were grounded, and U.S. airmail was being delivered by some contractor by Evergreen Aviation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Air mm -hmm. uh, in other words, Air America mm -hmm. and the South Air, there were CIA operations, and they were given priority, and our own neighbor out here was responsible for Security, uh, or a subcontractor that the security has been locked out of the country. So this is, uh, you know, it's, it's all down home. That's where we are. I'd just like to add one, one little tidbit that I've gained from this discussion today. Uh, there seems to be a, an iota of truth when the FBI came out and said that no black boxes were ever found in the wreckage. Well, <laughs> Very good point. When you look at all of the different diverse elements, all, all of the different agencies and all the different people that had to be involved in this, the controlling hand, the unseen hand uh, behind it all has to, had to be a global unseen hand. It had, to be, it had to be the mother secret society behind all of these. It couldn't have been just a CIA operation or Mossad operation or or something else. And, and that's where uh, my research into Illuminati is helpful because this is a global organization. It's, it's behind, it's, it's an unseen hand that has the capacity, the, is extensive enough to have pulled off something of this magnitude, which was pretty, uh, which was uh, pretty incredible. I mean, you have the U.S. military getting involved. You have um, contractors in New York City getting involved. You, you've got the FAA uh, getting involved. Uh, pardon me? The Navy. The Navy. Wow. So yeah, the, it, that's and, and so and that's one reason why I was excited about giving this talk, is I felt like this was maybe one of the pieces that needed to be put into place for us to help understand this crime. All right, let's uh, guess we'll Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate everybody coming out. I know you, Jerry. Richard, may I make a real brief? Yes. All right. A week from next Monday,